we move away from the enablers, the rainmakers, the deal makers, because it's now time to hear from people who have skin in the game. The Sions of India Inc. who are taking the legacy forward. Please welcome the next gen legacy builders, the young guns steering family businesses for this next discussion. Sudarshan Venu, the managing director of TVS Motor Company. Rosh, guys, some applause. Roshni Nadar Malhotra, the chairperson of CL Tech. And Puneet Dalmia, the MD of Dalmia Bharat Group. Please also welcome my co-moderator for this discussion, Soumya Rajan. We're making Soumya work really hard today. Uh, Sudarshan, Roshni, Puneet, have you guys met each other? Do you guys hang out? I think I'm too old to hang out with <laughs> you. <my guys. laughs> but, but hopefully this will lead to some new friendship. We will see some collaboration between the north of India, south of India. So. I'm, Puneet I'm is more my father's of... friend. You know? <laughs> now I also hang out with him. And I'm half of both. So I'm perfect. <laughs> yeah, Roshni is uh, half of both, right. So, uh, you know, we are not going to ask about top line, bottom line, profits, losses. We know all of them are profitable. They are not unicorns. And uh, their results are there for all to see. We are more curious actually about um, their own personal journey, which, uh, because each one of them, you know, has taken a very different path in terms of how they look at their family's legacy, their responsibility, um, and their personal arc. And that's what, you know, I want to start with. Um, so, Darshan, take us through your own journey as the leader of TVS Motor. What guided your choices and how did you prepare for it? Because, um, you know, it can't have been easy growing up under the shadow of two very successful parents. I mean, my parents are both here, so first I should thank them for this. I think uh, those of us who have this opportunity are very lucky. And I think also particularly in our generation, India is today on the global map. It's one of the best investment destinations, if not the best in the world. It has a fantastic demographic dividend, huge amount of talent and energy. So I think that has created an environment which is very conducive for Indian companies like ours to have a large market and to build from there. So I think uh, we are really in a lucky position. And as far as TVS is concerned, I think it has been really exciting to have the opportunity to do some of the things that we've been able to do to now invest behind electrification, to make aspirational products and build on technology, to leverage the Indian market to go abroad and make uh, investments, but also sales and local connected important international markets. So I think it's been very exciting. And I think uh, the future with climate change, with mobility solutions of different forms, offers huge opportunity for us. You're clearly giving the Olas and Ethers a run for their money. But uh, Roshni, you decided to focus on education, you're passionate about wildlife, you're chairperson of HCL Tech, but you know, you're not involved in the day-to-day -day part of the business. So again, what guided your choices and where you are today? And I must thank you for making it because I know it's very, very hard to make you talk at a public platform. We've been trying for years to get Roshni's time. We're so happy she's here. Thank you, thank you. Um, no, I think, um, my personal cho choices, um, I was just reflecting, Samya, on what you were saying. Um, I think when uh, I went into business school, I think Shiv's focus um, was that I, can't, I would be financially independent, but how do I become financially literate? And I think that was the reason why I pivoted from film and media to uh, to go to a business school and um, and I often tell this story that um, my first class in business school was statistics and uh, the professor asked that is there anybody in this class who's never worked on an Excel spreadsheet and only my hand went up <laughs> but that's that was a true fact so for me um, you know it was uh, two years of many firsts and when I came back uh, to India after that, um, the first place that I did work at in HCL was in finance. 
and um, I mean, education, wildlife, all that is in the foundation. It's, it's separate than what I do at HCL. But, um, and by the next year, by age 28, um, you know, I, I had already been made the CEO of the holding company. That's right. So, um, so I think that uh, I don't have an exciting personal story because, uh, like I said, um, our family office is me and Shikhar, my husband. That's it. Uh, I have no siblings, um, so it was just uh, uh, swim in the deep ocean, trial by fire, go for it, and then, uh, and, and that was 2008, now it's 23. So I think there's been a lot of learnings along the way. Right. Um, before I hand it to Soumya, Puneet, how has, you know, your journey been different from Roshni and uh, Sudarshan? So uh, we have a joint family business. And uh, when I joined, I was the youngest. It was my uncle, my father, and my uh, cousin brother. Uh, and I think the first thing was to earn credibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my uh, we were a multi, uh, you know, uh, industry business, cement, sugar, refractories. And uh, my father told me that, you know, you have to, uh, you know, we know manufacturing, but we don't know sales very well, because it was license Raj. Uh, we were a product of the license Raj economy and I joined in 97. So I had to literally shift, uh, we had one cement plant in Tamil Nadu and I had to shift uh, 3000 kilometers away from, you know, Delhi uh, and, uh, you know, go and understand the market uh, where I used to go in uh, like, uh, you know, scooter or a three wheeler to just understand, you know, how cement is sold. And I think, uh, you know, it was hard to battle mindsets because uh, it was an efficient company, successful company, but uh, you know, how do you you know get new ideas accepted? So you know, we launched two new brands, and uh, one failed, one succeeded, and then uh, I told my father that we should expand, and he asked me, uh, you know, uh, what will it cost? And this is 1999, and I told him it's going to cost 500 crores uh, to expand, uh, and he asked me who's going to do it. So I raised my hand. I said, I'm going to do it. So he turns around and tells me, I can't put 500 crores behind you. I said, why? So he said, because you have no credibility. So wow. I said, okay, then what do I need to earn credibility? He says, I'll give you two crores of my personal money. Uh, no questions asked. Uh, you go and do, you know, do something. So I quit the family business and I started a internet company with a friend of mine uh, from uh, uh, engineering school. And we started a job site called jobsahead.com. And Sanjeev was the big daddy in that business. We were like new uh, in it and I think he, we he just... He continues to be the big daddy. He continues to be the big daddy, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we went through our ups and downs, but we raised some private capital. Then there was a internet bust and we learned a lot because environment changed very, very quickly and you had to adapt. So a lot of interesting learnings in terms of raising capital, in terms of building a team, uh, in terms of adapting to a very volatile environment. And then I think we sold the company in 2004. And again, you know, how do you plan your exit strategy? And if I look back in retrospect, we sold the company at six times earnings. Uh, when Nokri went public three years later at 100 times earnings. So probably it would have been better to merge with, you know, Sanjeev's company, and which was an option at that time. Uh, but we, we uh, you know, wrongly wanted liquidity because we had private equity on our cap table. So I think lots of learnings in terms of uh, starting, in terms of adapting, in terms of selling. And I think then at least we didn't lose money. So I got credibility and, you know, I joined the family business and we got much more freedom. To That's a fascinating story. I, I didn't know the connection between Sanjeev and Sudalmya, but Soumya, you have... Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask a question to Sudarshan and to uh, Puneet on family values. Um, the family values, the legacy, um, because so much of that is part of the family business DNA. When you're looking at, let's say, um, modernization, or you're looking at newer things uh, for your respective businesses, how big a role does that play when you're assessing some of these? And uh, instances where you may have stepped back from a business because it didn't fit in with the family values or ethos. So I think uh, it's a great question. First of all, I believe that to, uh, you know, the way uh, nature runs, you have to, you know, preserve, you have to create, preserve and destroy. 
So I think it's very important to, you know, articulate clearly what you're going to preserve and what you're going to destroy because, you know, you have to also destroy something to create something new. So I think what is really important is you have to preserve values, uh, you have to preserve the core that defines you and, um, you know, you have to also, you know, destroy some legacy mindsets or some bureaucratic systems uh, and I think if you can articulate that well and, you know, ensure that uh, you communicate enough with people, uh, the journey becomes easier. It is not always perfect because there are some people who will always get threatened, uh, you know, but I think it, it just becomes a little bit easier because you have some critical mass. So I think uh, articulation, communication and, you know, constant perseverance uh, is, is very important because I think the world is changing very fast whether it is, you know, geopolitical issues, whether it's technology, whether it's, you know, climate change. And I think you have to be very flexible in terms of creating a strategy. No static strategy can work in today's world. So I think therefore it is, this is important. I think second thing is talent. And um, I think uh, what we have learned is family businesses have a big advantage because they can build a very sensitive and caring culture. So I think we have learned that you have to treat professionals like family members and you have to treat, treat family members like professionals. So I think that works really well. If you can, you know, be dispassionate in terms of evaluating the skill sets of family members, that helps. And if you can, you know, uh, give a caring uh, culture to professionals, uh, that helps a lot. I think the values form the bedrock of everything. So that's what creates the business, that's what gives you the differentiation, that's what gives you the ability to grow. So I think that is the basis. At the same time, I think the context changes, you have to interpret it in a different way based on the times today, climate change, it's a VUCA world. But I think to address those issues in line with our own values and for each successful business, there are many and for us, it's my father's always emphasized quality and customer focus and investing in technology. But at the same time, to apply this in the current context and embrace these opportunities, while also building new capabilities that are relevant, whether it's digital or uh, other capabilities today, AI, I think that mix is very important. And that's what I try to do. Great. Thank you. Uh, Roshni, you know, who has been your biggest um, influence or your mentor? I mean, Shiv Nada would be the easy answer, but anyone else who's really influenced you or you know, uh, who's sort of had the maximum influence on the way you operate as a leader? Yeah, I mean, my parents, for sure. Um, my life partner, for sure. Um, and I, I would say, um, I call him Ambi uncle, but Srinivasan, he... he sits, Reddington. Uh, yes, yes. He sits on the board of HCL Tech, but he was also my... Um, my father's roommate in college, so I've so I've known him all my life, and uh, um, yeah. So I I think just can, those can people. you elaborate on how each of them influenced you, whether it's Shikhar or it's your dad or Mr. Srinivasan of Reading? Well, I think um, uh, I think uh, Shiv for making me feel uncomfortable at all times. <laughs> Ambi uncle for making me feel comfortable <laughs> on, on all times, the yin and the yang, because they've known each other for so long, so they, you know, and I've known them individually, of course, in a relationship, but otherwise also it's so long. And, uh, um, you know, uh, my mother, who's the crazy Punjabi amongst us all, <laughs> and uh, so she's, uh, and she's pretty dynamic herself, and... She's the oldest uh, person participating in the Asian Games next week. She plays That's bridge. She plays bridge for India, and she's the captain of the open team. So, uh, so she's uh, and she's in. She left for Morocco yesterday. She's playing the World Bridge Championships there again as the captain of the Indian Open team. Wow! So, Our best wishes to her. Yeah, she's yeah. also a huge art. Uh, she's an art collector, but yeah. uh, bridge came much early. Art came <laughs> much later. Do, do you play bridge as well? No, I, she would beat me hollow. So <laughs> I did not manage to learn. Uh, and uh, and then of course I think uh, Shikhar as well, uh, professionally because as I said, our our family office at the moment is just two of us in the sense who you would consider next gen. 
and um, you know we at the whole core we have a balance sheet um, almost the same size as HCL Technologies, hmm. or if not bigger. So, so I think that there is, and um, we have one or two companies outside HCL Technologies. Uh, Shikhar being the CEO and chair of HCL Healthcare, which That's are right. our own private companies. So, um, so I think that uh, I, if I was to just compare to the two gentlemen on my left and right, I think we're probably in the early stages of a family uh, right. development or however that plays itself out. So I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, but it's interesting because uh, family businesses across the world as well as in India over so many generations, there's actually, when you look, uh, we're very privileged because we, we've seen a lot of successes and there's a lot of uh, uh, failures to learn from as well. Right. Thank you for that, Roshi. And uh, Sudarsh, my question is now to you. Um, you have grown up with uh, two very accomplished uh, parents who have been extremely successful entrepreneurs in their own right. What has it been like growing up um, in that environment? And also, um, how have you handled the burden of expectations? I think I'm very lucky and fortunate, and you have to learn from each of them different things which each of them are good at and then try to do your best. Uh, you can't keep thinking of what the expectations. You just have to try and do your best. Anything in particular for your mom? My that mother you told me when I was that. very young not to drive the car looking at somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice. <laughs> but um, did you have a difficult uh, choice? I mean, did you always want to be part of the TVS side or did your mom say, you know, there's also taffy? How, how did you handle that? I think motorcycles are a lot of fun, so I got that <laughs> excitement. Um, question for you, Puneet. Had it not been the family business, what would have been an alternative career for you? I went to business school he in almost Bangalore. almost became an internet entrepreneur. No, no, I went to <laughs> business school at IIM Bangalore and I was planning to join McKinsey. Uh, but uh, I went and did some research uh, and I spoke to a McKinsey partner who really opened my eyes. Um, you know, some of my friends are sitting here and uh, you know, they're in consulting as well. But uh, consultants draw two by two matrix to make decisions. And they said, you know, you should look at two, two dimensions. One is ability to create, make impact. And second is free time. So they said on both dimensions, McKinsey will be low and low. And your family <laughs> business would be high and high. So they said, you know, if you want free time and ability to make larger impact, join your family business. So I think it was a decision which really helped me. I don't know if there are McKinsey consultants in the room, but that's a great insight. Uh, actually, I have the same question for Roshni and uh, uh, Sudarshan. When you sort of looked at career choices, you, know, you mentioned uh, you dabbled with m media and everything. What were the other alternatives that you considered before deciding that, you know, this is what I want to drive as chairperson of HCL Tech, this is what I want to do at the family office. These are, you know, things that I'm passionate about. Were there other things that you considered? No, not at all. Because I think, uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't uh, uh, matter if uh, I'm a woman or not a woman. I was the only child. And um, as Shiv was growing HCL, um, you know, it's actually very interesting. I was just looking at some data today that um, in 2004, he assigned, uh, made Vineet uh, Nair hmm. uh, uh, president. In 2006, he made him CEO. HCL Tech actually listed in just 2000. So in six years, as a founder, he already stepped off CEO. And today he's 78, so that was that almost 16 years ago. And since then, HCL Tech has already had three CEOs. So, so I think that, um, it was fairly clear in his particular head also that he was stepping off from an active CEO role and focusing much more on um, the hold co and uh, the kind of governance and the kind of management that is going to require. So, um, I mean, it's, it's great that, uh, uh, you know, I, I could do whatever I wanted in undergrad. It was great that I got to work a couple of years uh, outside just to be able to learn I think just uh, ethics and discipline of working, that's it. 
and uh, then I was moving back um, anyway and like I said when I moved back I started working in finance and uh, again um, it's uh, not till I came on to the board at HCL Tech which was in 2013 was I ever in a situation where I was actually Shiv was my reporting manager mm. so I think that uh, it just um, um, evolved and uh, you know I think uh, we're we're fortunate enough that at the same time, you know, he was he started building the Shivnata Foundation in 1994. So that's right. quite early, and by now we've you know spent almost a billion in the foundation and we've opened the schools and the universities. So it was nice because I think that for an alternative to every day at HCL, there was also different institutions that were getting built out that you know one could be uh, much more entrepreneurial with and be a part of. Um, at the end of the day, I think it doesn't matter if it's non-profit, for-profit, if you're going to build institutions which are going to outlast the founders, hmm. then you know there are just uh, certain um, fundamentals of business and corporate governance which should be the same across the board. So right. I think, yeah. Right. So Darshan, the same question for you. Um, is it something that you always wanted to do? Did you go through a phase? where you wanted to do something else? I really was excited about motorcycles from when I was very young. And now, I, and I think I got the opportunity to pursue that. So, I'm, so that's that what I always, uh, so that's what I always wanted to do. But if for a moment I had to do something else, I studied a little bit of real estate at Wharton and a couple of my classmates whom I've invested with have set up very good real estate businesses in the US. So maybe I would have done that. Wow. Okay. So um, just a question now to all three of you. Um, as parents yourselves now, um, how are you thinking about communicating the family business uh, to your next generation? Um, how are you looking at it at this point? I think uh, my parents did a very good job of communicating it to us, so we'll hopefully try to do the same. But I only thought of that in the last two seconds because my daughter is only five, so I'm more <laughs> focused on having a good time. <laughs> I mean, my kids are uh, almost 11 and almost 8, and Shiv and Kiran communicated to me one dinner in London, and the next day I was doing my GMAT and applying to business school. So, yeah, we'll, we'll take it as it comes. So my kids are much older, 19 and uh, 15, 16. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, as a parent, I would want them to uh, explore and discover what they want to do and what they like. I think this comes with a huge privilege. Um, it also gives you an opportunity to discover what you are good at and what you want to do. So uh, I wouldn't want to burden them with uh, you know, joining the family business if they don't want to, uh, because I think uh, you know, listed companies require, uh, you know, in a very competitive and volatile world, the best uh, talent. If they are passionate, definitely a platform is available to them. But if they want to do something else, I would, uh, as a parent, want them to fly and discover their chart, their own path. And uh, how important is it to not work in the family business before coming into it? I think personally it helped me a lot because in a family business, you're in a little bit of an artificial bubble. Um, uh, everybody is, uh, you know, looking up to you. Some people are, um, you know, resisting you. Uh, so it's a little artificial kind of a polarized world. Uh, but um, uh, so I think it helped me personally uh, but at the same time I also feel family businesses can offer a excellent training ground uh, you can get a very holistic perspective you can uh, you know deep dive wherever you want to so I think both options are good it depends on how you um, uh, you know how your mindset is and what you make of the opportunity any comments on that? I worked directly uh, with my father from the day after school or college and I had a great opportunity and I enjoyed it. So I think I can relate to the second part of what Puneet said, but ultimately it's up to each one to make their own choice. Right. Um, I also want to understand from the three of you, you know, how have your family values influenced your philanthropic giving? Um, are there social initiatives that you're particularly proud of? I mean, maybe Roshni can start and Sudarshan and Puneet can. Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, the foundation was started in uh, 1994, and Shiv set up the SSN College of Engineering in Chennai. Which is one uh, of India's top 
colleges. In private uh, co engineering colleges, yes. And, um, uh, and till 1994 to 2008, uh, there was no action on the Shivnada Foundation, but just building that institution, and, uh, and rightly so. And in 2008, um, right after Shikhar and I got married, um, both of us were quite interested so um, that we wanted to also do stuff in addition to the work that we were doing. So in between 2008 to 2011, we opened uh, the two Vidya Gyan schools, um, the three Shivnada schools, and my mother launched the Kiranada Museum of Art. So within a span of three years. And then, um, you know, uh, I think between the four of us, we sort of decided that, uh, you know, Shiv would look, would manage the universities whenever he had time. Shikhar would do the Shivnada schools. I'd do Vidya Gyan, and my mother would do Kiranada Museum of Art. Then Shiv retired, so now Shikhar is the chancellor of the <laughs> universities and the schools, and I'm still Vidya Gyan. So it's, um, so yeah, we're very proud of the foundation, and uh, uh, Vidya Gyan's close to me. Uh, his turf is Shivnada University and Shivnada schools. So, um, and my mother's is Kiranada Museum of Art, so, yeah. yeah. I hear it's really tough to get an admission into Shivnada school. So, you know, a few of my friends told me that they opened up in Chennai recently and it, it got over in half a day or something, some new record for the school, so. Um, Sudarshan? I think uh, contributing has been, uh, back to society has been an important part of our group culture. And Absolutely. My father personally yeah. spends a lot of time. But one thing that I think is very important, which uh, he did and which we are trying to follow through long before it was fashionable, was sustainability in terms of water treatment, in terms of having nature reserves within our plants, in terms of afforesting large hills. So I think this is some things which we have done which was perhaps a bit ahead of its time and something which we really need to continue given the global climate change challenges that are there. Uh, so I had a question around uh, succession. Were there well-laid succession plans for each of you? Or was this something that uh, you kind of found your way into? How did the family work the succession plan? I think um, in, in our case, it was uh, in my generation, it was my brother and I. And I think there was no formal succession planning. Uh, and we wanted to professionalize the company, so we really got CEOs to run each business. And uh, we defined our role as uh, more of a strategic. Uh, but I think we. It's okay. Got it. I think we made our own constitution, we put our own rules. So there was not a formal process, but we put some formality into it, and it evolved out of our own experiences and, uh, you know, some guidance from our well wishers. So Mr. Subaya from Murugappa Group, he guided us. They've been in like five generations, multiple businesses. Mr. Guru Murthy, uh, you know, from uh, looked at fights in many Marwadi families. So I think he also guided us that, you know, how to ensure that you can guard yourself against, you know, potential conflicts. So I think we had some very good advisors and, you know, we had some, uh, you know, very open and frank discussions. So it evolved out of our own, uh, you know, a customized solution which we thought would fit our, our situation. Yeah, so I think uh, for HCL, um, I mean, if some of you know Shiv, there's nothing he ever does which is not deliberate. But I think that uh, succession planning for him probably started much before I came in. So as I said, that by 2004, he was obviously looking at himself also out of the CEO role. So he was looking for in within HCL to, for a CEO to succeed him, which happened in 2006 at which point he became chief strategy officer and he continued to be chairman. And then, um, and, um, then in 2008, when I returned, he said, you hang on around the holding company and understand uh, um, management. And in 2013, brought me onto the board. Um, and then by 2020 or 19, I think he stepped off being chair and the board and by which time, um, but me being on the board had already seen three CEO transitions and two CFO transitions. So I think that, um, so I think in, in HCL's case, the succession planning probably started 
much before um, considering family. So that's it. I think in my case also a bit, uh, it was a bit more unstructured and evolutionary, but yet with a clear direction and purpose. And uh, I think there was a very good management team, of course, already. And it was more a question of playing the role of the entrepreneur and learning how it was done and how to play that role and how to grow from there. So um, each one of you spoke about sustainability. Um, and what we see in most family offices today is that the next gen is actually leading the charge on sustainability. Um, could you share a little bit of light in terms of what each of you may be doing in that space? Um, I think in our case, uh, climate change and sustainability is really at the core of our business in terms of electrifications, in terms of the supply chains related to it. So for us, one of the major initiatives has been the huge investment we've made across electric mobility and mm. connectivity and digital to enable that uh, in terms of look at electric bicycles, electric scooters, electric motorcycles, which is the main focus, three-wheelers, cargo, today, tomorrow electric Nortons as well. We'll have the complete range of electric mobility and therefore I think in our business it's very directly relevant. And we see it as a huge opportunity which we are investing behind and embracing. Because when, uh, I know when Waterfield did an impact assessment, we saw that one of the most important areas that the next gen were focusing on was actually on climate change. So they were very clear that if they could look at more opportunities there, then that's really where they wanted to be. So would love to hear uh, what you have to say, Roshni. So again, I think, um, I think the, a big reason why that's also happening is because of timing and the ecosystem which is getting developed. So I just think that us as a, the uh, next generation is perhaps more aware and there are more solutions out there. As you mentioned, uh, in India, they're finding their way much more slowly, but the ecosystem outside in the world is much more developed. And I think globally, we're probably a lot more well-traveled and exposed and looking at partners and looking at solutions. So of course, across um, the HCL group, the HCL foundation, ESG as a publicly listed company, especially in the tech space, um, we're really scrutinized on, on that, not just on our own, but also now in almost every RFP that we get for a business. Um, there are at least 10 pages of just ES ESG. So, um, you know, it's also the environment which is developing. So, of course, what we're doing in terms of, you know, water or carbon um, as part of the foundation and the habitats trust with nature is the philanthropy and the CSR part of it. But I think there's also um, integrating um, ESG and climate in business operating models, which has also become the need of the hour. And um, that's still an evolving space, but um, there are lots of opportunities there. And, and it's one that I think globally markets are looking at much more closely. So the timing is right. right. So would you also have, just as you are expected to fill in a checklist, would you also have a checklist when you're making those investments uh, from the ESG lens? Is that something that you look at? Yeah, that's something that we would be looking at as well. We do it a lot more in the foundations at the moment. And the foundations, the foundations are very large in their commitments. and uh, but. Um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, for example, I just um, committed 15 million um, for the Aquapreneurs Innovation Initiative at the World Economic Forum. And every year, we are giving grants to 10 aquapreneurs, so people working in freshwater entrepreneurship across the world for the next five years. So by end of five years, we'll have 50 entrepreneurs. So these are not uh, social, um, these are businesses, uh, businesses across the world, and so we've given five last year. And so I think that, uh, like I said, I think India is still evolving. Mm. So that's why it just happened to be a global um, uh, fund, if I may. But um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, India is a, a champion in sustainability even before it became fashionable for the world to use it. If in every household, I can see that people recycle, I mean, we've worn clothes, uh, you know, which our cousins have worn. Uh, you know, very people are frugal about using resources. Even computers, we don't throw away, we donate it to some, uh, you know, a village or some school. So I think we have been a, you know, great champion in being frugal about using resources. 
Um, also, I think this is a civilization which worships nature. We worship trees, we worship rivers, we worship, you know, sun and the moon. So anybody who worships nature, you know, uses it but doesn't abuse it. And I think if I look at, uh, you know, every village, every city in India, I think uh, there are, you know, great examples. In our business specifically, I think we are in cement which produces like 7% of the world's CO2. So it's a very, you know, uh, you know, climate from a carbon footprint is very heavy business. So we are doing, going to do 100% renewable energy by 2030. We are trying to reduce fuel consumption. We are producing low carbon cements. And India is the lowest in the world in terms of carbon footprint. And Dalma is one of the lowest in India. So we are one of the lowest in the world in terms of our carbon footprint and we take very uh, proud, we are very proud of that. Also in our sugar business, we are making ethanol, which is a biofuel and which will replace, uh, you know, de uh, diesel and uh, petrol. So. I think uh, climate change is a very important part of every business and as Roshni said, as um, Sudarshan said, I think all of us have to uh, play our role not just because it is a business imperative but also because it's a responsibility that we have towards our planet. With that, I think it's time to wrap this very insightful discussion. Thank you very much Sudarshan Benu, Roshni Nadar Malhotra as well as Puneet Dalmia for your insights, for sharing your personal journey. A huge round of applause for them, clearly the future of India is in very safe hands.